Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video on machine learning, where we talk about uh, decision trees, which is another type of learning algorithm and hypothesis set we can use. So let's try to start out by motivating it. All right. So in the last video, we looked at this supervised learning setup, where the basic setup is, again, just to remind ourselves, uh, there's some unknown target function f that maps d-dimensional feature vectors to the labels from a set of labels y. From this unknown target function, we see n training examples x1 to xn, so these are feature vectors, and the corresponding labels are evaluations of this unknown target function f. So we see f of x1, f of x2, up to f of xn. All these training examples are then fed into the learning algorithm, which uses this training data to find a hypothesis g from a fixed set of hypotheses h that hopefully looks a lot like the target function. In particular, if we feed it in new data, it's going to fairly accurately predict uh, the label of the evaluation of the unknown target function on this new data. That's the general supervised learning setup. Then also in the last video, we saw this perceptron learning algorithm, which was a linear model, right? Where uh, we think of the data element as having these features x1 to xd, a special hard-coded one on the first coordinate, and then the labels are minus one plus one. And with this uh, definition of input, we search for a hypothesis, which is a linear model. And the hypothesis is defined by d plus one weights, w0 up to wd. And for any given choice of these parameters, you can use this hypothesis to make predictions by evaluating the inner product between the feature vector x and this vector w of parameters and taking the sign of it. So if it values something positive, then we're going to predict the label plus one. If it, predict, if it values something negative, we're going to predict the label minus one. Right? So that was all in the last video. Right, and then we also saw an example of an algorithm for how to actually choose such parameters w. And this was this perceptron learning algorithm, which initializes the vector of weights as the all zeros vector. And when, while there's still a data point that is misclassified, so point x comma y, where the prediction that you would make using the vector w, taking the inner product between w and x, evaluating the sign, while this is not correct, right? So it's different from the actual label of the training point then we could update the hypothesis by adding y times x to this w. Okay, and when everything is classified perfectly, we return w. And we also saw a version of it in case of the data could not actually be separated by, by a line. But this was the simple algorithm that we looked at. And right, so linear models were motivated, for instance, by this example with uh, whether you should approve a mortgage uh, where you have historic data on uh, the price of a house and the salary of the person who wants to buy the house and whether or not the professionals uh, had approved or declined the application. Right? And here it made sense that there might be a linear uh, relationship between the salary and the price of the house that you're allowed to buy. So, you know, using a line to determine whether you should approve or decline would make sense in this case. So that's an example of a, of a linear model. Good. So linear models are useful whenever data can be really separated by a line or hyperplane in higher dimensions. Okay, so... Taking that back into the supervised learning setup, if we use this running example, right, for mortgage applications, right, so then the unknown target function would be the correct mapping of salary and uh, price of house to whether you should approve or decline. And if there is such a thing as a, as a correct mapping, but, but let's uh, say there is. And then we have historic data, which uh, consists of the concrete features, meaning the price of the house and the salary, as well as the outcome of, uh, of the application, whether it was approved or declined. The hypothesis set down here could then be all the linear models W, so all the ways you could choose a vector W and, and use it to make predictions by taking the sign of the inner product with the feature vector. And the learning algorithm here would be this perceptron learning algorithm that we saw at the bottom, the one that keeps updating uh, the vector W until it finds one that perfectly classifies the training data. So this is just taking that example into the supervised learning setup. Okay. So of course, linear models are not perfect and there are some shortcomings that motivate uh, in particular the other models that we'll see in this video, right? So for instance, in this example here, the data that I plotted here, it seems that there's a very simple way to classify the data, right? You just want everything in the bottom right corner you should classify as blue and everything else is red, but there's no line or hyperplane at least uh, in 2D here, that will do this separation for us, right? So it's not really linearly separable. And so maybe you would want to consider a different type of hypothesis than a linear model, right? So linear models are not the only thing. Uh, this, is a, this is at least an example where a linear model in itself would not do that great. Okay. So, so therefore, there are other types of models that you could consider, right? And one that we'll see here is decision trees. 
So decision trees is a different type of hypothesis that you could use to classify. So you're not going to take the sign of an inner product in this case, but instead you're going to have what's called a, a tree, a decision tree. That's a small example over here. So I'll try to get into the details of what this example illustrates, right? But so maybe we can consider a setup where uh, the input is different features of the wine, and we have to predict whether this is a white wine, a red wine, or rosé, right? So the three classes. And what we know about the wine is something like maybe the color intensity and, and other things, right? So, so what we'd like to do is maybe, you know, train a machine learning model, train a hypothesis that can correctly predict uh, what type of wine is this, right? And so for that, we'll use an example, a decision tree. And decision trees are a different hypothesis set than the linear models. And therefore we also need a different learning algorithm, right? We, don't, we cannot re reuse the perceptron learning algorithm. So we'll see examples of that, okay. So, okay, so the running example is this classifying wine into red, white, and rosé. And the way that we have, if we have such a decision tree, the way that we make predictions on a given feature, uh, feature vector is as follows. So what we do is we start out at what's called the root of the tree. So here at the top, this is the root of the decision tree. And then each of these nodes in the decision tree uh, have a condition written in them. Right. So for instance, this condition says the color intensity is less than or equal to 3.46. So we have a given feature vector X. So what we do is we test this condition on the feature vector X, right? So X has a feature that's called the color intensity and we test whether that color intensity is less than or equal to 3.46 or it's greater than or equal to. And for each of those two outcomes of the test, yes, yes and no, or true or false, uh, there are two separate children that we may descend into. So we're going to descend into the correct child and keep asking questions. For instance, if we go to the right child here, the next question will be, uh, is the flavonoids less than or equal to 1.435? Uh, true, false, you go into two different children, and eventually we will end up in a leaf. So a leaf is one like the one you see here on the left. And at the leaf, the stored label or a value, and this is the one you return. So here it's stored, white is stored in this leaf, so which means that we will predict that the class of the wine is white, so it's white wine. Okay, so the root is just this top node up here in the picture. The leaf is any of these square boxes here where there are no more arrows and no more questions to ask. And the edges to the two children correspond to whether or not this, this uh, logical test returns true or false. Okay, so every node in this tree, every internal node, so every node that's not a leaf, uh, there is one question and that question tests one feature against one value, at least in the simple setup that we're going to consider here. So it tests the feature color intensity against the concrete value of 3.46. So that's the type of questions that we have in the notes. Okay, so if we go back to this example of data that we have in the beginning that we saw this was not linearly separable, you can see that it's actually easy to build a decision tree that perfectly classifies this data here. So, right, so if we look at it and plot it, you could see that the, there's the first feature on the x-axis and the second feature on the y-axis. And you know, let's say that this is at the value three, that it changes from, from red to blue. And it's at the value five, you know, we change from, uh, and in the blue region, we change to red above it. So there is a decision tree that corresponds to this prediction that's been shown here. And that decision tree is as follows, right? So we start at the root where we ask, is feature A less than or equal to three? So that's basically looking here at the y-axis and taking the value three. And then we're testing on any given feature vector, right? So think of one of these dots or triangles. If we were to test uh, which label to assign to it, we would ask first, is the A feature less than or equal to three, right? So if it is, then we know we're on the left side of this vertical line here at three. And we can see here in the picture that all the training data over here has the label uh, red. So we, it's safe to just say we return red in this region. Otherwise, if the feature is greater than or equal to three, right, we know we're to the right of the vertical line through three. And as you can see here, right, the data is, it's easy to ask a question now that separates the, the red uh, points from the blue points. Namely, we ask whether feature B is less than or equal to five, right? So that asks uh, the horizontal line here uh, through the data. And if it's true, right, if, we're, if the feature B is less than or equal to, to five, we'll just return blue, so which means we're in this bottom, bottom corner here. And if we're above, we return red. Right. So we can actually build a decision tree that corresponds to, to this prediction here. Right, so if we look at the supervised learning setup now, uh, with the decision trees, the hypothesis set is now the set of all possible decision trees, right? So every single way you could build a tree with questions and values in the, in the notes.
Good. So, so now we know what the hypothesis set is. Now we, of course, have to figure out what is a good learning algorithm, right? How do we, given training data, find a good decision tree for the training data, right? So how do we build and figure out what are the questions we should ask? What are the values that we should compare about, compare the features to in each of these internal nodes, right? And if you recall, right, from uh, the previous videos, we said that uh, a classifier is good if it correctly classifies most of the training data. Right, because our intuition was that if we are good on the training data and then hopefully the training data looks a lot like new data, so the performance should carry over, right? When we give it a new data item, it should also perform well on the new data item. That was the intuition that we were building on. Okay, good. So good performance in training data hopefully means good performance in new data, right? Namely, exactly this that we said that the G, the hypothesis that we find by searching for one that does well on the training data, hopefully looks a lot like this unknown target function F. Good. Now, there's a pitfall you have to be careful about here with the decision trees that was not relevant for linear models. And that is that no matter what your data set looks like, it's actually always possible to find a decision tree that perfectly classifies the training data. So let me try to show you how that can be done. So what you can do is you can you know, start by picking an arbitrary one of the training points, for instance, this one here. And now let's build a decision tree that kind of just zooms in on this point. Right. So let's say that the feature A value of this training point is three and the feature B value is four. What you could do is you could create a decision tree here starting at the root and first you'll test is feature A less than or equal to three. If it is, then you compare is feature A also greater than or equal to three. And if that returns true, right, then we've actually tested whether the feature A is equal to three. Right. And then secondly, we can have two more questions determining whether the feature B value is equal to four. And if all of these things are true, right, the only point that can actually satisfy this is this single point here, right? So we can kind of zoom in on that one training example. And then we can just safely predict red so to get the, the class here. So it kind of just corresponds to creating a little square a region that only contains this one training point. And then we'll just return the class there. And of course, this is going to get that point correctly. And it, this is not going to affect any of the other points in the input. Now, this is, of course, just making the tree correctly predict one of the points, but you can keep growing the tree. So let's now pick the second, the blue point up here, right? So that's it's A feature is two and it's B feature is six. So what we could do is we can start by figuring out, okay, so where does this end if we keep traversing the current tree? Right? Because we, we know it's a different point than the red one over here. So it's gonna, some somewhere it's gonna fall off this path. And if we look at it, right, it's feature A value is two. We can start looking at the root and say, okay, two is less than or equal to three, so it will descend into the left child. Then the question is, is feature A greater than or equal to three? That's actually not the case, so this is false, so which means that if we kind of look for this blue point in the current tree, then we would uh, leave through this, this edge down here. Okay, so what we can do now is then we can just kind of copy the process that we did before. Now we can just zoom in on the blue point in this subtree here, right? So now we just test whether the A value is exactly two, then we test whether the B value is exactly six. And if that's the case for both of them, then we have just zoomed in on this single point and we can return blue. And as you can guess, right, we can just keep doing this for all the data points. Every single training example, if it's different from the previous ones, it's gonna fall off one of the edges that we haven't filled out yet in the tree. And from there, we can just grow these, ask these four questions and completely zoom in on, on the point. And so of course, this will be a really large decision tree. In particular, if we have N training examples, the tree will have like more than n nodes. So it's a huge tree and it will just kind of build a little box around every single point. And of course, then there's all the remaining things that are hanging off, all the things that, you know, are not ending in a current leaf. We can just create a leaf there and, you know, maybe let it return red, you know, who knows. Of course, this tree is going to perfectly classify all the training data. But if you think about it, right, what is the chance that this will do well on a new data item? Well, it seems like nothing, there's no chance at all, right? If if you get one of the training examples that you had it during training, then of course it's going to do well. It's going to predict it correctly. But if you get anything that wasn't in your training data, then it's just going to predict red, right? So it's just always going to predict red on anything it hasn't seen. So, you know, so it doesn't seem like just perfectly classifying the training data in this case actually leads to good performance on new data. So that's something to be aware of, right? And of course, right, the thing that seems to go wrong here, if you think about it, is that this is really a complicated decision tree. It's huge, right? It has a, 
a leaf, it has its own leaf for each of the training examples, right? So it's, it's gonna be a really large tree if we have lots of training data. And this is really what we call what we call overfitting, which is something that we will return to later. Uh, this concept of just building a huge model compared to it's a, basically as large as the training data, right? So we'll return to this in in more depth later on. Okay. So now the idea or the goal to actually get around this is that we would like to actually find a small decision tree that does well on the training data, right? Because the problem here is that this decision tree gets really really large, and that seems to be the issue that it can kind of just in some sense, just remember the whole training data set and, and do arbitrarily uh, on, on all the things that are not in the training data. Right? So the goal or idea is to find a small decision tree that does well on the training data. Okay, and, and this is motivated by what we call, we will prefer to find simple explanations of the data. Right? And we'll try to motivate this later. Why, why is this a reasonable thing to, to look for simple explanations? Okay, good. So how do we now... Uh, figure out what is a good decision tree in particular what is a small decision tree right so maybe we could ask you know why not just search for the smallest decision tree that perfectly classifies the training data you know if we can find the smallest one maybe this is a is a good decision tree now the issue is it can actually be proved that this is np hard this is an np hard optimization problem which means that if you at least if you didn't have a cause and complexity theory it means that there's probably not going to be a fast algorithm for finding it right not any algorithm that will finish in reasonable time on on large data sets so this is just infeasible to actually find the smallest decision tree that perfect classifies the train data okay so this is a little bit unfortunate that we cannot actually find the best the smallest one okay one could also ask, you know, okay well, what about just finding the best performing decision tree that has exactly k nodes in it Unfortunately, this is also NP hard, right? So you cannot even do that. Okay. Even though it would have made sense to say I have a fixed budget on the size, give me the best one. But that's also NP hard. Okay. So what we actually do in practice is that we come up with some heuristics that, well, by the end of the day, hopefully it finds good decision trees. Right. And of course, one can always tweak these heuristics, but here we we'll just see the basic idea of one way to find a good decision tree. Okay. And so this, this, uh, this algorithm that we're going to see for building small decision trees is, is basically a greedy algorithm. And it's kind of motivated by just looking at a simple case first. So let's try to see what, say, what if we know that the decision tree we are to build can only contain one node, right? So this means that, well, the root has to be a leaf, right? That's the only way we can have only one node. So we want to find a decision tree that has just a root. Okay. So if I were to design a decision tree for this data here on the right that has just one leaf, it means that we have to immediately return a value. Right? Then there's not really any doubt about what's the best thing to do, right? What is the best choice for the root? If we have to return a label immediately, then it has to return either red or blue in this case, right? Those are the two classes. And then we can look at the data here, right? If we, if we choose to return red in this leaf, then the accuracy will be three out of eight, right? There'll be three red points here that we will get correct out of the eight training examples. So the accuracy will be three eighths. On the other hand, right, if we actually choose to return blue in the in this leaf, then the accuracy will be five over eight. Right? So of course, five over eight is better than three over eight as accuracy. So of course we should just uh, return blue in this node, right? So actually, if we just have a single uh, node, it's easy to actually find the optimal tree. Right, so so here we can actually find the the best performing tree. So we should of course return blue in this case. Okay. Now, moving on from that, what if we then what is the next kind of level, the next step or size of a decision tree is to have one root and two children, where the children are leaves themselves. Right, so the, the leaves, the uh, the children are leaves. We have one question to ask. Okay, so then what? This is what we call a decision stump. So what's the best we can do here? Right, so what is the best choice of root? Now, one should maybe ask oneself, what are the different candidate routes that we should look at, right? What are the different choices we could make here for, for a root? And so if we think about it, if we have a fixed training data set of n uh, points, there are really only n minus one different splitting points that are relevant if you have n training examples, right? So those splitting points will be between every pair. Like, so for instance, we could choose to separate here. So you know, ask a question that separates are we to the left or to the right of this line? We could also ask here, left or right, left or right, 
and so on, right? So there's basically each of the splits between these points. These are the only places it makes sense to ask a question, right? If two different splits that lie between the same set of points end up in the same accuracy here. So, so basically we're just gonna consider a split between every pair of points uh, on, on the one feature. And of course we should do that for every feature, right? We could also choose to ask about the B feature here, the, the Y coordinate of the points. And again, the N minus one relevant splits to consider in this case. So the basic idea is just to say, okay, if I wanna find the best decision stump, I could just try all of these splits, right? So the D features, there's N minus one relevant splits. So I just try all of them, you know, and uh, for each of them, you know, when I'm testing a split, I wanna figure out how good is this split? You know, is this a good split I've found? And what we do is that once we've already determined what the split should be, the only thing that's left to choose is what are the two leaves. And we already know from the previous uh, slide or the, where we had just a single leaf, we already know how to choose the leaves, right? So for instance, right, if we're testing this split, right, let's say, okay, now I wanna test the split, is feature B less than or equal to five? How good is this split? Right, then we can compute if I, if I already settled on this split, I know that these are the data points that go on into the left child and these are the data points that go into the right child. Now, since these are leaves, they have to return a label immediately, right? So they should, of course, return the best possible label, the one that gives the highest accuracy. This means that, of course, the left child here should return blue because there's a majority of blue elements and the red child should return, or the left, right child should return uh, red, sorry. And this will result in an accuracy of six out of eight. Right? You will misclassify this uh, one red point, which is also sitting here, and you'll misclassify this one blue point up there. So the quality of this split is really, or the, the score, what you, what you want to call it is six over eight, right? It achieves an accuracy of six over eight if I use this split in the root. So actually now the, the simple algorithm for finding the best decision stump is just to loop over all D features and for each of them, run over all the possible splits. And once you have that split with this value, right? You have this, you choose this feature against this value. You just try to insert that as your root. This partitions the point into the two uh, children. And for each of the children, you just figure out what is the best value to return here because this is a leaf. And then you can compute the accuracy and you just loop over all the possible splits and use the best one that you found. This is the simple algorithm for actually computing an optimal decision stump. This gives the best one. And we can of course ask yourself, you know, what is the running time of this algorithm? And well, the D features to, to, to look at for each of them, the N minus one relevant splits. So that's an order N factor. And, you know, once I've chosen the split, I, I fixed the root. Now I need to partition the points into the two children. I need to compute what is the best value to return in the left child? What is the best value to return in the right child? This requires, this can at least be done by looking at all the points again. So that's another linear factor. So this results in a total running time of n squared d. Right. Now, this is, of course, is polynomial time. It finds the optimal decision stump. But if you have a really large data set, say with millions or maybe even hundreds of millions of training examples, this is really infeasible to have this quadratic dependency on, on n. Right. And, you know, it's a, it's a reasonably simple exercise to improve this running time to something like n log n times d. So this is nearly linear in the input size, right? It has n input data items uh, with d features each. So, so like linear in the input size would be nd, you pay a logarithmic factor on top of it. So, so near linear time. You can actually do it fast. Okay, but, but the simple algorithm is just the one that's shown here, and then you can speed it up if you will. Okay. So, so now we know how to build decision stumps quickly, right? How can we, how we can actually compute the best decision stump, the optimal one. So what if I wanted to grow a larger tree, you know, something that has higher depth, it's not just one root and two children, right? So we know that this is NP hard already from, from previous slides. So the greedy algorithm does as follows, right? So the greedy approach is to say, okay, let's say, Beforehand, I decide on a budget of how many nodes I want to put in my tree, how many internal nodes, or how many questions I can ask. So if I have a budget of k internal nodes, what I could do is the following, right? I could start out with what I know. I start out with a root, that's a leaf, and now I repeat the following process k times. So I look at all the leaves in the current tree. In the beginning, there's only the root. 
And then I take that leaf and then I say, okay, what happens if I insert here the best possible decision stump for all the data that ends in this leaf in the current one? So I kind of grow the tree by replacing a leaf by a small decision stump. There I know how to compute the optimal decision stump. Right? So I, I try all of them and I use the best split the one that gives the best accuracy, right? So I, so I grow my tree by one node. So I can, but I can try, there might be several possible places I could do this. I could choose each of my leave, current leaves. I could choose to split that one. I just try all of them and I try all the possible splits for all the leaves. And then I find the one that does best, right? So let's look at an example here with just, let's say we want to grow a tree that has two internal nodes. So K is equal to two. So we're going to repeat the following K times, right? So we start out, by having the best possible tree with just a leaf. And of course, in this data, it should return blue. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to take the, the single leaf that we have, which is the root, and then we're going to replace it by the best possible decision stump. So we need to figure out what is the best decision stump on this data, right? And we already know that we can just try all the possible splits and figure out what is the best accuracy we can obtain. And here, if you look at it a little bit, uh, you'll never achieve an accuracy that's higher than six over eight. So we can, this is one split that achieves it. So we'll find this one, right? So we'll find the best possible split and this is one of them. Okay, so now we have a tree that has a single root. It has two children that are leaves and it achieves an accuracy of six over eight. But now the algorithm says that we still have, we still have a budget left of internal nodes, right? We want, we want to have two internal nodes. We're currently only using one. So the algorithm tells us now to try all the leaves and try to replace it by a decision stump and the best possible decision stump. Okay, so there are two leaves now. There's both the, the left uh, leaf and the right leaf. And we want to try and replace both of them with a decision stump. So we can go over here on the left. Uh, okay, so this has an accuracy of six over eight. We can try to, right, so this leaf down here again corresponds to the blue region here on the left. Now, if we were to ask one more question just inside the blue region. What we can see is that it's not really possible to separate out this red, uh, this red data point from the blue ones, right? So no matter where we ask it, whether we ask on feature A or feature B, we cannot really separate the red point uh, away from the blue ones. So the best we can do is still get an accuracy of 608. For instance, using this split here, we can return red on the left half and blue on the right half. So this is gonna achieve an accuracy of 608. So that's the best possible choice if we, re if we replaced uh, the left leaf. Now, what we should do is we should also try to replace the right leaf. Right? So the right leaf uh, was, again, it's the red region here at the top. So we want to build the best decision stump for uh, the top part here. And as you can see here, the blue point has a y higher Y coordinate of feature B than the two red points. So, so up here, we could actually do a split just between this, this blue point and, and the two red points so that the red points are below and the blue one is above. And this would create this decision tree here, right? Where the red one is isolated, uh, or the blue one is isolated here and the red one's isolated here. And this would actually lead to an accuracy of seven over eight. We would only have the single point that is misclassified. So we had these two candidates, right? We could either replace the left child by the best decision stump or the right child by the best decision stump. And we test both of them. And we found out that the right one here results in the best accuracy. So this is the tree that we now choose to produce. Now, of course, if we had a higher budget of uh, nodes, we could keep uh, going with this process. In general, this is a one approach towards growing a tree uh, by basically by repla iteratively replacing a leaf by a decision stump. Right? So this is the final tree in this example. So the greedy algorithm is just, Given a budget of k internal nodes in the decision tree, start out with a root that's a leaf, repeat k times, try all the current leaves in the tree, and replace them by the best possible decision stump uh, that you can. And you compare over all the leaves of which one, which, which replacement results in the best final accuracy. And then we just use the best one of them. So we grow the tree by replacing that leaf by a decision stump. Of course, there could be other approaches, but this is this is one approach. The other one is maybe you know maybe you don't have a budget of the number of uh, internal nodes, but maybe you have a budget on the depth, right? So you say, okay, I'm only allowed to grow a tree that has a depth d, and this is not the same d as the number of features. Sorry, this is just some uh, depth parameter. You could you could be a, another 
uh, it could be something less than d th than the number of peaches. So here you could again start with a root that's a leaf and then repeat until you reach the depth budget where you just take all the current leaves in the in the tree and replace them by the best decision stump. So you kind of grow the tree one layer at a time. Right? That's another approach that you could use. And as you can see here, maybe unlike the linear models, it's actually fairly easy to extend these decision trees uh, to cases where you have more than two classes of data, right? So it's not necessarily blue and red, uh, but also a green color. Again, think of the wine example, right? You could both have white wine, red wine, and rosé. And the algorithm is just very easy to extend to this setup, right? So the algorithm is, is just the same, right? Repeat k times, try all the current leaves, start off with the root that's leaf, and replace it by the best decision stump. And use the best of the possible replacements and keep going. And the only thing that we need to, you know, we know that we still have to test all the splits when we have a, a feature that we chose to ask a question on. The only thing is we just need to figure out, can we actually still figure out what is the best leaf to return? Right? And, and that's again easy if we have a leaf. So we have all the data points that end there. Right? So now there can just be multiple colors, right? They can both be green, blue, and red. And of course, we should just always return the color that we have the most of, right? So over here, if, if you think about it, right, there's one red point that ends here. There's three blue points that end up in this region. So of course, we should return blue in this case, right? And if we look at uh, the two leaves down here, these are, there's only one color inside the leaf. So of course we just return that color. Right. So this is a, this is the only change is just, it, it's, a, it's a slightly different way we choose the leaves. And we just uh, look at the majority, the, the, the most frequently occurring label um, instead of just among two colors. So that's the whole difference, right? So, right, so growing small trees is hard. It's hard to find the best one. So, so therefore, right, there's been a bunch of different heuristics that people have come up with uh, that seems to do well in practice. And one of them is this greedy approach that we just saw. Right, and many of the standard library or the, the different implementations you can find online, uh, they, they will vary in how they grow these trees, right? They have their own implementations with their own heuristics, trying to quickly compute something that's a good decision tree. But this is, greedy thing is a basic, one basic approach towards it. Right. Now, in the second part of this lecture, there's another video on, on this material. Uh, we'll try to look at a different heuristic for growing these small classification trees that we just saw. And this, this approach, it's, it's very similar, but we're using, instead of measuring the accuracy as we go along, uh, we'll uh, grow the tree by looking at something called the entropy or the information gain instead. And this is something that seems to work better in practice. Right. We'll also discuss how this can be extended to other notions of error other than just uh, misprediction or correctly predicting the, the label of a, of a point. Right. So, And finally, we also look at the case. So if you remember a running example we had in one of the previous videos was uh, predicting the price of a house. So there it's not a, a value that you're predicting. It's not a label the same, but it's a value instead. It's a real value. So how can you use decision trees to predict values instead of uh, classes or labels. So that's also something we'll see. Good, that's all.